Well, how do you two family? It is Bolt CRNA coming to you again with another day's topic. So this is actually a part two of my Tom Barry Bolt interview. We actually talked for so long, turned into such a long video, I had to break it up into two parts. So this is our two parter, second part of it, and we're gonna get in with Tom now. So I just curious if you were to say do a healthy lap coli, say you were going to do a lap coli on me, no medical history, ASA one, maybe two. Um, what would your technique be anesthetic wise if you were using no opioids? There's there, there's two ways we can we can go with this, you know, um, and two ways to kind of to do this. Like, so are we talking about the the really good surgeon who does a lap coli in 45 minutes? Or are we talking the, the surgeon that no one really wants that's, you know, does three hours for a lap coli? Let's make it interesting because I think most people can answer easily the t first one, but let's answer when you run into the challenge of the second one where you do reach for like the five cc fentanyl syringe and you're having to do way more than you thought you would have to. Let's, let's see what that one looks like. Sure. And, and we can do both if you want. Um, Sure. So, you know, the, the big thing sort of overarching when you think about opioid free anesthesia that you want to watch out for is postoperative sedation. We're, all the medications we're using are long acting medications. None of them have reversal agents. And so the big thing when you're learning to do an opioid free anesthetic is you want to make sure you don't give too much um, and have a patient that's sleepy for two or three hours post-operatively, uh, you know, that just utilize, uses up your resources and you do that routinely and, and people are going to start complaining about your technique. Yeah. The, the, most of when we talk about opioid free anesthesia in our techniques, that's the big thing we're trying to avoid. So really the basis of most opioid free anesthe anesthesia, uh, looking in the literature, there, there's two ways it kind of went early on. Um, and the first way was just replacing fentanyl with Presidex. And what the majority of studies show is that if you do that in a one-to-one -one ratio, so you take the amount of fentanyl you would normally give and give that much Presidex. So 100 to 200 mics of, of Presidex, you've got comparably stable uh, vital signs intraoperatively, um, but postoperatively, you're gonna have a lot more sedation, but less pain. Uh, but you know, for that kind of two hour period, the patient's gonna be really sleepy. And we can't really have that in, in most places that we're giving anesthesia. It can't take someone two hours to get out of PACU. And that's where this sort of multimodal approach has come from, because when you use three to four medications, you can use sort of the minimal doses of each one of them, avoid, uh, the, avoid the side effects of each of them by using really low doses and avoid that post-operative sedation. Oh, and oh. so, you know, the, the big three is, you know, ketamine, Presidex, and lidocaine. And you may or may not see magnesium added to that. And sometimes people are places where like they don't have Presidex, so they'll do ketamine, lidocaine, magnesium. Um, you know, and, and you can really sort of mix and match that a little bit. But sort of looking through the literature, that's the, the standard three. So the big thing about Presidex, it's a great drug, but you have to administer it slowly. Otherwise, you get the sort of rebound hypertension from it. And it's slow acting. It takes about 10 minutes to reach its peak effect. And so my induction dose for a healthy person is around a half mic per kilo, uh, 30 to 50 mics of Presidex. And so what I would do is I would put that in a syringe, you know, 50 mics in a syringe. And starting when I'm bringing the patient from pre-op back to the operating room, I would start working that in 10 mics at a time so that by the time I'm doing my induction, it's already starting to work. And, and the other nice thing about doing that is that, you know, you don't need Versed because it has that nice anxiolytic effect. Hmm. So start working that in, you know, bring them back to the operating room, put the monitors on, pre-oxygenate the patient. 
when I go to put the patient to sleep, do my induction, I'm going to give a half milligram per kilogram of ketamine, 30 to 50 milligrams. Also going to give uh, between one to two milligrams per kilo of lidocaine. And typically that's going to be sufficient to blunt the res response to laryngoscopy, get you intubated without becoming hypertensive, tachycardic, that sort of thing. Can I stop you real quick and ask a question? So with the, um, and I do a lot of these things, th not the exact things you're talking about, but I use ketamine and Presidex and all this stuff quite often. And the problem I run into with lidocaine, which I like to use is sometimes I have patients get pretty squirrely if I give one to more or so milligram per kilogram of it at kind of close together and the ringing in their ears and they kind of get a little panicky occasionally. I don't know if you've ever seen that before. Um, sure. You know, the other thing I've, I've noticed, I don't know if you've noticed this, is given a bigger dose, they tend to cough a little bit. And I don't know what that's strange due yeah. to. You either have it mixed up in your propofol or give the propofol immediately afterwards. Mm -hmm. You know, they're asleep for that part. And yeah. if you're giving a, a bigger dose, you can divide it in half, give a little bit up front just to block the burning from the propofol, and then give the rest of it after the propofol's in and they're asleep. And if you give the ketamine, are you, you said you gave the, your ketamine usually when you're getting onto the table, like you're putting EKG leads on and stuff? No, no. Um, I don't give the ketamine. I give the ketamine immediately before or immediately after the propofol. Okay, okay. That's what it was. And I was wondering, because sometimes my patients, when I give like 30 to 50, they can get kind of, uh, they can become odd <laughs> pretty quickly. So Right, yeah. You know, you can give ketamine to completely awake people, but in the like 10 to 15-ish milligram range. Yeah, the safest thing to do, you know, is um, give, give them after the propofol's in between the propofol and the rocuronium. Nice. Um, and you know, then if, you, if you've got that fast surgeon that, that knocks it out in an hour, um, I'm not gonna give anything else other than that. I mean, that's really, you know, um, you know, you can, you know, I generally have 50 mics of Prestex, 50 milligrams of ketamine and syringes, you know, I'll give 30, 40 on induction. If there's any response to surgical stimulation or intubation, I can give the rest. Um, but again, because they're such long acting drugs for, for an hour, hour and a half case, I'm not going to need to give anything else once you you know they make incision their heart rate their blood pressure hasn't gone up you're good um and and that's all i'm going to do for for those cases and so outpatient surgery center fast turnovers you're really looking at the same number of syringes that you would use for a typical anesthetic right instead of versed you've got presidex instead of fentanyl you've got ketamine you're drawing up the lidocaine anyway it's Simple. You know, it's just different drugs doing it a little bit different. Same number of syringes. Okay. And they wake up fairly smooth and pack you and they get, you know, not too long with that amount. Right. Exactly. Okay. You know, so the thing with opioid free anesthesia is that the time from, you know, you turn the gas off, you turn the propofol off, whatever you're using to keep the patient asleep. The time to open their eyes is a little bit longer, maybe five, 10 minutes longer, but they wake up much more alert. And so their, their pack you stay isn't any longer. You know, if you're the, the guy that does a deep extubation um, and takes them to, to pack you with an oral airway in, you know, you've got an extra five minutes before they open their eyes. What they do, they, say, they open their eyes, they say, can I have a cup of coffee and they're ready to go. Wow. Um, versus, you know, a traditional anesthetic where they're still really groggy, maybe confused, things of that nature. Um, so if you're the type of person that needs the patient to be awake before you're willing to extubate them, uh, there is a little bit more of a learning curve. You, you have to relearn when to, to turn your gas off. Um, but, you know, a couple cases uh, are going to take a little bit longer and then you, you kind of get the hang of it. It's just a different, different feel, a different technique. Nice. Okay. Well, I really like that explanation. And I think that's going to be helpful, especially for the students out there who are trying to visualize what does it look like in a case to do a normal case, but not to use any opioids and how do you wake them up and stuff. And I, like you said, I'm sure there's a little bit of a learning curve that you kind of get used to your timing. Um, but it seems, it seems worth it. Yeah. 
And yeah, no, absolutely. I currently do a hybrid kind of, I use Presidex and I use ketamine a lot of times and I use some lidocaine and I even use a gram or two of mag sometimes. And, but I still will use like 50 of fentanyl on induction. So I won't use ketamine on induction. I'll usually use ketamine uh, right before incision or something like that, but sure. uh, like 20 milligrams or something like, like that. But, um, but I still, it's, it's like the, it's cause you're trained to do it. Like you, in your mind, you're just shoved into doing that. So many times as a student, you've done hundreds of cases in training and you, in your mind, you think it's cruel to not give 50 of fentanyl on induction at least. And, uh, sure. And you know, the other side of that is when you're in training, you've always got back up there. Once you're out on your own, um, it can be a little scary to, to try something radical and new, uh, without someone there who's done it to, to really walk you through it. Right. I, you know, it's a, it's a pretty big leap of faith. And, you know, I think it's a, a credit to CRNAs and how seriously we take the responsibility of patient safety. Um, and, and it, but it makes us kind of, of hesitant to, to embrace some of these techniques and things. Totally. Yeah. So I want to know about what kind of obstacles you've come across since you created the Society for Opioid for Anesthesia. You've been doing all these conferences and talking to people and, you know, doing things like this. Has anything been a problem in your workplace or in your personal life while you've been trying to run all these things and be this voice? Change is hard, right? And you know, there, there's the continuum of people from the people who are excited about the possibility and want to try something new to the people who are like, you're a terrible human being for, for doing this and I wouldn't let you anesthetize my dog. And, you know, and you get these like personal attacks and you're just like, buddy, I'm not telling you what, how you have to give anesthesia. I'm just throwing options out there, you know, and, and talking about the results and, and, and options, you know, um, but it, it's it's funny how personal people make it sometimes. Um, and we can go into, you know, talks about how sort of online an anonymity plays into that and all these other things. Mm -hmm. um, and, and at the end of the day, you sort of have to learn to sort of let that roll off your back and, and keep going. And one of the things I really had to uh, make a conscious decision about was not arguing with people about it, you know, and, um, you know, even the people that were, you know, very uh, sort of abrasive in their criticisms. Mm -hmm. and, and I've only got so much time in the day and I'm only willing to put so much of my life into this. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm not willing to let this, ruin my family and ruin my self-esteem and make me depressed and, and all these other things. Um, and there's plenty of people out there who are, are hungry for the knowledge and, and want to get into this. Mm. So I just made the decision not to, not to even engage with the critics really, uh, but just focus my attention on uh, the people who are looking for the information. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I really like that. And, and I have to say to the people who are naysayers, which there's always naysayers. And I mean, CRNAs are amazing anesthesia providers, but they're very strong personalities in general. And sometimes they can be very aggressive in their opinions or perspectives on things. So it can be difficult to be a voice in this community that is, that is CRNAs because you can have quite a bit of a, an assault almost verbally. Um, but I think that even the people who are naysayers need to understand this technique and understand how to not use opioids for the very fact that like this isn't going away. It's actually growing quite exponentially. And even in my own practice where um, I, I, I am like a breaker one day, I may go into a room and give someone a 30 minute lunch break. And that may be like my role for the day is to help, you know, be a resource and give breaks. And, um, and I, there's a lot of CRNAs in my group and physician anesthesiologists in my group that I give breaks to who use opioid free techniques. So I go into a room and I'm in the middle of a case and I need to understand like, okay, there's a thoracic epidural, they've got lidocaine infusing, they've got ketamine and Presidex infusing, a profile infusing, a half mac of gas. Like if you don't understand how to manage these types of techniques at all, it's probably going to come up at some point in your professional career where it would behoove you to understand at least a little bit about what's, what's going on with this and how to kind of utilize this if you need to. So that's why I recommend everyone to at least know it somewhat, even if it's not your favorite, you know, first pick for a technique. Sure. And, you know, kudos to 
the people in your group for, you know, I feel like we're still very much in that early adopter phase. And, and like I said, you know, five years ago, people didn't even believe it was possible um, or had never heard of it. And now we're at the point where I feel like it's at least a household word and even people that don't practice it just accept that there are people out there doing it and it's a valid technique, you know, and, and certainly with the, the growth in, in research studies, you know, there's only been one study that has shown uh, opioid free anesthesia to be inferior. Um, and, that, and that study wasn't really even necessarily about opioid free anesthesia. Um, that just, it came out earlier this year. Um, you know, but there's dozens and dozens of randomized controlled trials and, and other than that one paper, not a single one of them show the technique to be inferior. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you know, spot on when you said that um, it's, it's a technique that you're going to have to know how to do. And, you know, we, we're not talking as much about the opioid epidemic right now because of COVID and and all that, but um, it has actually made the opioid epidemic exponentially worse. Um, you know, it's been growing by 20, 30% a year since this has been going on. And so on the other side of this, now that we've got the vaccine out and we can at least see a light at the end of the tunnel, uh, the opioid problem is gonna be so much worse when we get back to sort of looking at that and dealing with that than it was going into this. And so, you know, what are you going to do when you have those patients sh showing up to your, your facility in recovery? Um, it's, it's a technique you need to be able to, to do. And, you know, the other point is that the, the regulatory agencies are starting to uh, reimburse for opioid-free anesthesia. And uh, Julia Harris, she's a CRNA out in California, um, has been instrumental in getting Medicare to start reimbursing for opioid free anesthesia. So you're going to see groups more willing to adopt it because there's a uh, higher reimbursement for it. Mm -hmm. And on the other side of it, on the sort of MIPS quality side, one of the quality indicators is opioid use and multimodal pain therapy. You know, so that's something that's having to be uh, at least offered or given to every single patient. Mm. So there, there's there's multiple pressures from sort of all sides, you know, regulatory, financial, patient quality, patient outcomes that are that are driving this. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. It just keeps coming up more and more in discussions and in, in what we're doing in anesthesia. I've noticed it acutely because I went from hearing just a little bit about it as a student to uh, two years into practice now. It's a topic that comes up over and over, like you said, reimbursement and other, you know, regulatory agencies are involved in it. Legislators were asking me about it when I was talking to them a year and a half ago, two years ago at, at Mid-Year Assembly in DC. Uh, it's something that's just on the tip of a lot of people's tongues. So it's important to know about it. And, uh, and that's why I wanted to highlight you. That's why I wanted to focus on what you've been doing and, and the, you know, the work that you've been doing, because you started doing it long before it became such a hot, you know, topic item or something trendy to discuss, but just something that you felt passionate about that you wanted to show those guys in your university setting that uh, Esmolol infusions was not the good idea to do. And so you use that to spur you on. And it's funny how that turns into what it is now. Yeah, well, I appreciate you having me. I always enjoy the chance to, to talk about it. Yeah. Well, can you tell everyone what you've been doing with the Society for Opioid Free Anesthesia or SOFA, which it's, I think it's goopioidfree.com. Is that correct? Correct. That correct? Yeah. Uh, you guys can visit that for more details about it, but what have you been doing with the society and what do you have planning coming up? So, you know, our hope is obviously that we're going to be able to get back to in-person meetings again here coming up shortly. We're, we're sort of caught cautiously in the early stages of, of planning another in-person meeting. Uh, but another one of the things that sort of come out inadvertently of the, the COVID epidemic is this sort of transition to online learning and webinars and things of that nature. Um, and so we're really kind of working hard to get a, a monthly uh, educational product going where we can 
talk to people all over the world who are experts in really driving the research on this to talk about what is the, the you know, latest research saying, what are you working on? Um, and we're really working hard to become sort of the, the meeting place for internationally for all the people working on this. That's awesome. So do you have any kind of tips or words of wisdom for all the CRNAs or uh, nurse anesthesia residents out there who are hearing about this, who have kind of this entrepreneurial kind of progressive spirit like you do, who says, I wanna create something new out in the world. I wanna progress something. And maybe it's something new. It's a small little idea, but like you had about Esmolol infusions and stuff, but they know they want to go forward and do something. What kind of words of wisdom would you give them? Just go and do it. Uh, you know, that's the, that's the big thing. If it's something that you're uh, passionate about, uh, you're going to have people telling you not to do it. There's going to be a thousand obstacles, um, but you know, the process of, of working through that um is what's gonna kind of make it great so yeah you know just go out and do it and uh you know deal with those as they come yeah it seems like you it was something that you researched and you studied you gave presentations on you kept talking about and in the, in the world of medicine and anesthesia and nursing if you start talking about something enough and presenting about it enough, your friends start saying, hey, why don't you come to this conference and talk about that? Because we need someone to discuss this new technique or whatever. And you suddenly start becoming the expert and then it starts snowballing, you investigate more information and stuff. And, and like you're saying, if you just keep going for it, it grows. Yeah, and you know, the other big point that, you know, you kind of alluded to there is that uh, for as scientific as we are, um, you know, this profession is driven by relationships. Use this as an opportunity to, to work on yourself and emotional intelligence and salesmanship and all of those types of things, but build the relationships as well. Because if this was just me, uh, you know, founding the society and I didn't have other people I was working with and people backing that and people who believed in it, it, it would be meaningless, right? You know, I founded the society because I couldn't keep up with the demand for the information, um, you know, and I could have gone out and started a society and filed the paperwork and absolutely nothing would have happened. Mm -hmm. So, you know, talk about your idea, what's going on with other people, but go to the meetings and, and build those relationships. And the, the best way to sort of do that is to do that serve other people you know don't make it about i'm i'm here to to give you you know to do this thing for you um but you know meet people's needs and take care of them and that's you know how you you can go about that that's awesome yeah i think there's a definitely a spirit of people in crna uh, in the world of anesthesia who know when you're kind of promoting yourself or you're just pushing something forward because it's like a business thing that makes you profit or something kind of very selfish. And not a lot of people usually get behind that kind of idea, but if it's people who are out there creating something that's gonna help other people out, uh, like a medical app or uh, you know studying methods like for boards and stuff, uh, things, things that are, or Society for Opioid for Anesthesia, these types of ideas that have been created by CRNAs, they're not really created selfishly just to promote a person or their own personal interest. It's usually something that somebody's identified as, as what something they need to put out in the world or help other people with. And they think it's a good thing and they put energy into that and other people back you up. They want to connect and network, create relationships with you and they want you to you know, succeed. Well, all right, Tom, thank you so much for coming on today and talking to the folks. It's been a pleasure having this time and we are going to keep in touch with you. And I want to see what you're doing in the future with the so uh, SOFA organization. And uh, maybe I'll be at one of your congresses or meetings in the future. Thanks for having me.